so let's get on to the fundamentals as we normally do on a Wednesday starting off. So um, US dollar. So US dollar at the moment, um, I did have it as an auction stroke range, right? Basically, an auction is a range, depending on how you want to... Um, uh, how you want to describe it right and what we've seen i guess with um with the dollar index is exactly that right so we've seen the dollar uh pretty much in this in this auction right so i was saying it from from last week around last probably the, the week before maybe somewhere around here that we may see depending upon whether the Federal Reserve were likely to cut by, um, you know, 25 or 50 basis points, right, that the dollar was likely to do something like this. And basically, this is what, you know, it's done, right. And um, speaking of the dollar, of course, today, we did have, um, you know, inflation numbers came out. Now, uh, it's interpreted as it says underlying U.S. inflation unexpectedly picked up in August on higher prices for housing and travel, undercutting the chances of an outsized Federal Reserve interest rate cut next week. So while Wednesday's reading won't deter the Fed from cutting interest rates next week, it reduces the chance of an outsized reduction. So pretty much as we know, well, we should know is that um, the Fed were basically looking at inflation. And if inflation, you know, came in uh, lower, right, then it was basically, they would, they would, the market was looking to price in probably about a 50 basis points uh, cut if it came in lower. But because it's kind of seen as coming in slightly higher, so it could be kind of stabilizing. They think that 25 basis point cuts, 0.25% um, is enough or should be enough for now. So that was really the debate over the past, um, you know, couple of weeks, depending on obviously the data. And so today's come out, which is, you know, convincing the market that in fact, the Fed is likely to cut by 25 basis points. And so, um, while I don't expect the dollar to really kind of rally massively, um, I think definitely the downside for the dollar should be, you know, limited, right? The downside should be kind of capped. Now, of course, that can change depending on what happens with um, with data. There could be data that comes out, um, you know, uh, that, that kind of convinces the market that, in fact, um, maybe there might be some sort of soft landing or, or economic um, news, jobs, employment data that might come out, which may start to convince the market that the US is entering into a recession sooner, right? And if that is the case, then of course, upside would definitely be a lot more limited. So we have downside limited, upside, you know, capped. Um, so you're seeing, you know, basically the market price in the value of uh, the dollar, right? So between uh, certain highs and certain lows. So um, that's kind of backed up as well by the latest uh, FedWatch, um, the FedWatch tool. And we got the market pricing in a 17% chance of a 50 basis point um, cut and now an 83% chance of a 25 basis point cut. Uh, yet yesterday it was 66%, one week ago it was 56% and a month ago it was 49%. So you can see the odds of it increasing and that, you know, kind of aligns with, I guess, what we're seeing, you know, on prices as well, right? So we saw a low and then, you know, this was, I think, the market pricing in potentially 50 basis points. And as we've kind of, the market started to price out 50 basis points, we've seen, again, the... um the market, uh, you know, obviously limit the downside. So for me, <clears throat> um, there are reasons to buy the dollar. You could, if you're, you know, um, watching or following the elections closely. I know there was the debates last night, um, was last night in the UK between Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, sorry, and um, Donald Trump. And depending upon uh, what the market kind of thinks uh, in terms of who's likely to win. Um, you know, if Donald Trump wins, it's seen as actually uh, a bit positive for the dollar. And it's not to say that uh, it's going to be negative for the dollar if uh, Kamala Harris um, 
uh, wins, but um, it's just kind of seen as more positive for the for the, for the U.S. dollar due to, I think it's some uh, trade uh, negotiations. So if you go to the United States, what you'll see is there's, and by the way, you can also as well search. I, I definitely advise you guys to do um, searches, um, and that's the reason why I actually post um, a lot of the articles. Because I remember someone asking me, why do you post the articles? Why not just post the link? And one of the reasons, actually, is because if you type in, for example, you know, Trump, uh, you know, um, uh, trade or whatever it is, it comes up with a whole load of articles within um, the uh, within Discord, right? So you can kind of get to all the articles that you need to read about, you know, uh, Donald Trump, the Trump trade or, you know, whether the US dollar is good for, you know, the... Uh, um, uh, uh, Trump is good for the US dollar, right? So, um, your own little, um, I guess, uh, trading, uh, uh, Google search, right? So, or Discord search. So, it says here, analysts are saying that the dollar weakness that follows versus Trump versus Harris debate signals markets think Democrat contender won. Ultimately, this is because it says, but why is the market reacting this way? Uh, a first point to make is that Harris presidency is not an outright negative for the dollar. Rather, a Trump presidency is seen more supportive of the dollar. Ultimately, this is because Trump is seen as being far more hawkish on international trade, particularly with regards to China. So uh, you can read the rest as well. Uh, but ultimately, there are reasons to buy the dollar. So I still kind of stick, I will stick with the um, with the bias that we should probably remain in some sort of auction, meaning that you can sell at highs, buy at lows. <clears throat> um, the Trump trade, if of course, you know, Donald Trump starts to excel in the polls, then that would be positive for the dollar. Um, I guess short term positive for the dollar is also as well the recent uh, 25 basis point, uh, you know, expected cut which is going to support the dollar for now, or at least limit any downside. So again, the dollar is, I think, there, you can find reasons to do either, right? And um, and ultimately, this is just a synopsis. So I'll just read the rest of it, and then I'll move on to the New Zealand dollar. So it says uh, here, while Wednesday's reading won't deter, yeah, so I read that. Even so, policymakers have made it clear that they're highly focused on softness in the uh, labour market, which is more likely to drive policy discussions and decisions in the month ahead. Okay, so that's where the focus is now, right? And that's what I think I was saying before with regards to unemployment uh, could be uh, a driving factor of the dollar. So it says they'll also have more data to consider leading up to their November, December meetings. Central bankers are increasingly paying attention to the labor side of their dual mandate amid emerging cracks in the labor job market. Sorry, hiring over the past three months is the lowest since mid 2020 while job openings declined and layoffs rose in July. Anecdotally, employers have also indicated they're becoming more selective in hiring, which is which with some cutting hours and leaving fact, uh, vac, uh, 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 vacancies sorry, un, unfilled. So um, the Fed do have a dual mandate, and a dual mandate is... You know, most most central banks pretty much have an inflation mandate to get inflation down to their two percent target. The Fed and I, I think a few others um, do have a dual mandate, meaning that they actually need um, have to get employment to a certain level as well, or they don't allow it to. Go, they try not to allow it to go above a certain level. So that's how they kind of control uh, the reasons why they would try to uh, high core or cut interest rates if it, if if unemployment gets you know too high for example yeah then they would have to end up cutting rates right to support the economy to try and 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 businesses to try to you know get them to kind of hire you know and uh, and get the unemployment rate down right um so that's one of the uh the mandates that they have uh, let's just look at Patrick says, if the Fed is behind the curve in terms of rate cuts, do you think there is a chance they may surprise the market by cutting by 50 basis points? The inflation reports, they should back this decision. Um, I don't think it is back in the decision, to be fair, Patrick, because if it was, then you would 
um, the market would be pricing in 50 basis points. Yeah, so I don't think at the moment the market is is you know is is looking at the inflation report and saying well they could you know uh, cut by 50 basis points there is there is obviously they could all, always surprise the market right central banks have definitely been known to surprise the market but at the moment i would rather go with the odds rather than you know the 17 percent chance of um of a 50 basis point hike right of course that's probably where the money is that's definitely where where a lot of the money will be made if you guess correctly if you bet the direction that they will um you know cut by 50 basis points there's a lot of money to be made but um remember these are this is reflecting institutions putting their money where their mouth is right so there is you know this is i'd rather bet on 83 percent chance than um then um you know a 50 percent chance plus as well even if even even if you are right let's say for example you are right yeah about the 50 basis points or you're just overall short on the dollar anyway yeah let's just say so if you still have a a, a short bias on the dollar because at the end of the day they are cutting uh rates and expected to cut rates um not only in september but in you know november and december right so if you're still short on the dollar, just based on the fact that they're on their, their cutting cycle and they could be cutting uh, more than other central banks uh, for the rest of the year, then imagine you, you could be in a trade as prices pull back on the dollar, you know, to get short. And let's say you're in a trade short and then they do cut by 50 basis points. Then brilliant, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? You're, you're, still, you're still in that short trade. So it's more about, I mean, I... I personally do still have a short bias on the dollar, you know, for now. So whether they cut by 25 or 50, um, to me, uh, doesn't really matter so much because I'm just looking for pullbacks anyway to look for uh, short trades on the dollar, especially against something like the pound, because the pound are going to be, you know, the Bank of England are going to be cutting less, right, than the Federal Reserve at the moment. So that's, you know, what, what I would uh that's my analysis on it anyway sometimes it's not it's not about you know trying to get what they're going to do right it's just about getting the direction and if you know if you get the direction right and they surprise even more in the in the in, the, in your direction then you can just capitalize or hold the trade a lot longer so um yeah i still even though you can look for buys at low sells at highs my bias though my personal bias would be more to look for sell trades than buy trades uh for the us dollar so new zealand nothing much um no really updates from last week uh i'm still got a sell bias on the new zealand dollar especially um because we are in a little bit of a risk off scenario as well environment um i did i don't know if anyone checked it but i did check the uh the vix right so the vix is um hovering around this 20 uh mark and we've had a bit of obviously vol volatility um you know above 20 is considered risk off the higher the vix goes the more intense the risk i guess risk off sentiment right so risk uh, off sentiment. So, you know, this you can see this clearly playing out, um, you know, uh, when we had uh, the beginning of August, where we had that kind of combination of, I think it was NVIDIA, their earnings came out, um, disappointing the yen carry trade. And there was something else. I can't remember the other risk. There was three uh, 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 things that was happening simultaneously. But yeah, so... Um, yeah, if we do get prices moving above the 20 and starts to go higher, then you're likely to see risk off assets start to come into play. So risk off currencies would be, um, you know, the Swiss franc as well as the Japanese yen. So this is actually playing out really well with my yen trades. Um, and I'll talk about those, uh, a bit later, but, uh, when it comes to the New Zealand dollar, for me, again, nothing's really changed from last week. Um, and so I've got a sell bias. My sell bias at the moment, the three pairs or the top pairs, I would look towards um, buying the uh, uh, against the uh, New Zealand dollar would be the pound, 
the Australian dollar and the yen. Um, and when it comes to the uh, New Zealand dollar index, you'll see in that again play out. Uh, it took a while to turn around, right? When it was grinding higher and everyone was like, what's happening, what's happening, what's happening? You know, the fundamentals um, for the um, New Zealand dollar, um, you know, weren't great, right? And we got actually, we actually got a rate cut here. It was on the, um, it was on this day, the 14th of August, there was actually a rate cut, right? And so when it, whenever you get a rate cut and they're still on the cycle, Anything moving higher should be seen as really um, expensive. And now we're getting back into this zone where prices really should be heading lower. So, yep, I think it cleared out a lot of traders over a couple of weeks, you know, going higher, taking out liquidity and stops. Right. And then came to really a, a, a nice area where prices have been traded before with a nice area of supply as well. Right. And then obviously it's gone to the short side. So I I would expect that to continue. And what's compounding it obviously is um, some risk off sentiment as well. So um, if you're in that New Zealand yen short uh, from the last uh, couple of weeks, you should be doing all right. Um, so, yeah, continue shorts on the New Zealand the Japanese yen, um, again, I've got a buy bias on that, had a buy bias since they hiked rates. So pretty much um, when we did see the rate hike in uh, in August, um, that was really where I said, yep, yeah, I want to start to look for some long trades. So it was, yeah, it was, it was around here, wasn't it? This is where it, where it started around the beginning of August. Then you had obviously the, the the carry trade unwind. Then we got a nice pullback, and then this is where, you know, you should have been really looking for buys on the yen. It took a while to play out, but again, remember institutions don't trade like retail traders in terms of they have you know medium to long term, um, you know, goals and forecasts, and even the way that they enter, right? They have to scale in because they've got massive positions, and that can take days weeks and even a month or two right so um yeah you're seeing it play out eventually uh higher yen and if you you know if you were paying attention uh you know from that uh beginning of august you know the uh the yen was definitely a buy my my buy bias would have been or was against the swiss franc and that trade actually was a really nice trade um, I'm out of that trade now, that that uh, Swiss yen trade that's from the stop hunt. I'll go over that a bit later. I'm still in the New Zealand dollar yen and I'm still in the um, the, the the CAD yen as well. So I'm still in these two trades. Um, but the news clip, it says here, Japan's economy expanded in the second quarter at a pace slightly lower than the government's initial estimate while still advancing enough to keep the Bank of Japan on track to raise rates later this year. So, um, yeah, nothing's really changed too much uh, for the yen, um, although there was slightly lower um, GDP that came in, but it's not enough to kind of put the Japanese yen um, off of hiking rates. And then there was some, um, I think today, earlier today, there was... Um, uh, was there like a statement or something like that from oh no I, that's where I, I i heard it it was in the, in this video um the analyst said i think i remember his name was mark something he said basically that the uh, there was a um a, a board member a bank of japan board member who is normally dovish and in fact he was he had some hawkish statements and so um with that you know, and also with some maybe some risk off sentiment coming into the market, um, that's just you know a perfect storm for the yen to continue to um, to appreciate, right? And so again, my bias is really for the so that's, that's, that's I said possible hike in July. Really, um, it definitely is a hike in July, so that should be updated. Um, but yeah, just more buys, right? More buys against uh, these these uh, these currencies. Um, the British pound. So British pound, again, a buy bias at the moment, although there was data today that came out 
that was showing that the economy kind of stagnated a bit, um, came in lower than expected. Again, the when when trading the news, it's really you should kind of keep one eye on whether that news announcement is going to affect the central bank's thinking as to whether they're likely to cut rates or you know or hike rates for example if they're on a hiking cycle or what they're going to do with their uh their monetary policy right so um and the way to kind of do that is just to sometimes actually a lot of times what i do is i just wait right i don't try and trade the news um i rarely try and trade the news in real time i pretty much just sit there wait for the news to come out i mean if it's a massively you know massive number massive miss then there's obviously an opportunity there but more often than not what i typically tend to do is wait for the um the news to come out wait for the market to kind of digest it get a few you know clips and and, and analysis and then i'll make my move as to whether it is likely to um you know affect the central bank's thinking right and what the analysts think so although it says here signs of a cooler economy will be welcomed by the BOE, uh, which signaled that stronger than expected growth could hold up its interest rate cuts, right? Um, Governor Bailey, uh, Andrew Bailey, said the robust recovery in the first half of the year threatened to keep inflationary pressures higher after the Monetary Policy Committee reduced rates for the first time in over four years in August. While traders do not expect the Bank of England to loosen policy again at its meeting next week, so that is should be... Um, you know, uh, so should support the pound, they are betting on a move towards a quicker cutting cycle later in the year. So a shift towards expecting more loosening has, be has caused, uh, has been caused by growing concerns about resilience of economic activity, um, particularly in the US. So um, when, so uh, what's, oh, what's it called now? It's gone from my head. Um, it's called the... It's called the, the curve, the curve, the it's called Phillips curve, right? The Phillips curve um, basically talks about when unemployment is it's the relationship between inflation um, and unemployment. So uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because what the central bank, what the Bank of England want and all central banks want, in fact, to get inflation down, yeah, to get, oh, one second, let me uh, get the right colour pen. So to get inflation down, right, certain things have to happen. Or in fact, the way I'll explain it is this, right? So um, I spoke about this before. So you've got cycles, right? And these cycles all pretty much are in you know synchronization to some degree right of course it's not perfect right but imagine this is interest rates right that's the interest rate cycle this one is the inflation cycle and this is the gdp cycle business cycle yeah and they all should move they all should move together when you have uh, a contracting economy you should have lower inflation, which then means that you should, as central banks should want to cut rates, obviously, if it's below, if inflation is going below the 2% and the economy looks like it's going into a recession, right? So they all move together. Now, when it comes to unemployment, yeah, um, it says here, inflation and unemployment typically have an inverse uh, correlation right but the relationship is obviously a complex one so in times of low unemployment employers typically need to pay higher wages to attract employees and ultimately leading to rising wage inflation so low so in so here's a question right so when do we typically have low unemployment during the contraction and recession phase of the economic cycle or during the recovery um expansion phase of the economic cycle so when do we typically have low unemployment patrick says booming expansion anyone else anyone else recovery too yeah recovery too right 
Anyone else want to have a go? Anyone disagree with Patrick? Yeah, no, no. All right, no one's disagreeing with Patrick. Right, so Patrick is right. So if we normally have low unemployment, yeah, during the growth phase, yeah, of the economic cycle, then we typically as well should have rising inflation as well, yeah? So low unemployment, yeah? Employees need to pay higher wages, ultimately leading to rising wage inflation. So again, rising inflation. Yep, so inflation rises, that checks that out, right? And also as well, low unemployment during the growth phase of the economic cycle, that checks out. So if you need inflation to come down, yeah? If inflation is to come down, yeah? Or let's say inflation is being stubborn, yeah? So inflation is coming down, but it's not quite coming down. As a central banker, what do you want to see happen in the economy? Do you want the economy to contract or do you want it to still grow? So if you want inflation to come down and it's been coming down, but not quite to your 2% target, what do you need the economy to do? Do you need it to contract or do you need it to grow? Patrick says contract. Uh, Jason says contract. So that exactly, that's exactly it, right? Everyone's on the ball, right? So you need it to contract. So if it's not contracting, yeah, if it's not contracting, and in fact, it might be reaccelerating. Yeah, Deirdre says contract, excellent, right? So if it's set, if the if the if the economy is not contracting, then the central bank have a bit of a problem, right? Exactly, Patrick, ahead of the curve, right? The inflation may go up. There you are. All right. So it all makes sense. And the Phillips curve is just understanding the relationship between unemployment and inflation. But you can, if you, you know, you can kind of get to it and derive all of that from just really understanding this, right? This whole, you know, the, how the curves, the, um, the cycles um, are in sync with each other. Yeah, exactly. So inflation may go up, which is basically what the central bank, the Bank of England, yeah, are saying here, right? So they're saying that the shift towards expecting more loosening, loosening meaning cutting, has been caused by growing concerns about the resilience of the economic activity, yeah? So the resilience of the economic activity, meaning that because the economic activity isn't, um, isn't causing inflation to go down, yeah, they may have to, you know, loosen a bit more, right? So um, as they need inflation to uh, hit their 2% target. So yeah, pound for me anyways, is a buy, right? Buy bias, yeah? So if I'm buying the British pound, I'm buying it really against the dollar, the Swiss franc and the CAD. Those are my three picks, of course. You can look to buy the British pound against something like the New Zealand dollar um, as well. Um, and possibly, I'm trying to think, yeah, maybe the New Zealand dollar, maybe the euro, maybe the euro. But again, you might want to add the New Zealand dollar to that as well. But those are, would be uh, the main picks for me. Um, euro, so euro again. There are reasons to buy and sell the euro. Nothing's really changed from last week. Uh, the market is pricing in the probability of, or it's definitely priced in the um, a rate cut on well, which is tomorrow, right? So we don't necessarily expect um, fireworks tomorrow. It's really more about their forward guidance in terms of what they're going to do and what they signal in that that they're going to either cut or hold in. October. So that's really where the focus is. So the market is practically a given that they're going to cut tomorrow. So now it just becomes about October and whether they're going to skip in October or whether they're going to cut. Now, 
um, according to, I guess, the most recent data, it does look like they may, I think it's like 50-50, that they may uh, look to, I think I've read somewhere that it, they may cut in October. So it's not a given, but the, 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 the more likely they are to cut in October is the more actually, in fact, you'll see the market price that in and the euro should devalue. If they, if there's not going to be an, an October cut and the market prices that out, then you should see the euro rise, especially against, you know, something like the uh, the dollar, because ultimately, if the dollar, if the if the Federal Reserve are cutting rates in September, you know, October, um, and maybe November, right? Is it have they got an October cut? I don't think they do. As it goes, I think it might be September, November, December. One second, let me just have a quick look. On the Fed watch, oh, yeah. So September, November, December, right? So they're looking to cut three times. Whereas, let's say the um, the ECB are only looking to cut twice. Yeah, if they're only looking to cut in September to match the Fed, but then they skip October, and maybe they cut in you know December or something like that, November or December, and you've got the Fed that actually cut you know, three times then, um, and, and the ECB cut twice, then the euro should, 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 should appreciate, you know, over the medium to long term um, against the uh, the dollar, as well as some other, you know, currencies as well. So remember, it's, it's really about who's cutting more um, and how quickly and how deep are those cuts. So, um yeah, pretty much the euro. You can find reasons to buy the euro. You can find reasons to sell the euro. Um, my bias, though, I'm I'm still a bit middle of the road. I would buy the euro against um, the dollar. I'm more probably bullish on the euro dollar, um, but against something like you know the yen or the or the pound or the Australian dollar, I, that it, it would be a sell, right? So um, that's where I am with the euro. Uh, right, so the euro is that the Swiss franc. So there was an interesting article as well uh, in the Discord uh, uh, group, and I took some of the uh, some of the points from it. And it said here uh, the Swiss franc's rally to the strongest level in almost a decade has raised the prospects of the first large interest rate cut by a major central bank this year. Right, so. It's basically saying that they could cut by 50 basis points uh, rather than 25, which is what everyone else has been doing. While economists forecast the Swiss National Bank will lower rates by another quarter point cut when it meets next meets on the 26th of September, the probability of a half point reduction has been rising steadily. Market pricing now implies a roughly one in three chance up from zero just a month ago. The franc's advance is cramping exports and lowering the price of imports at a time when inflation is already well within the SMB's target, right, and near a three-year low. So um, pretty much nearly every week I go over this, but I know we've got a few people who um, may be a bit new or maybe they haven't watched uh, some of the recent videos. So I'll just go over it again quickly, right? So remember that central banks have a 2% target. Currently, the uh the Swiss National Bank, I think their inflation rate is at one point two percent. Yeah. So, if uh, I guess if inflation, right? Uh, how do I put this? Right. So, if prices, if 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 inflation is going higher, yeah. Let's say for example, it's going to three percent. It obviously, well, I say, I say obviously, but it means that the currency is getting more devalued. Yeah, it's increasing its devalues, getting more and more devalued as inflation rises. Yeah. Now, if prices go below that two percent, this is what's known as deflation. Right, so deflation. Actually, deflation is 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 maybe below. Um, technically, it should be below zero. Right, but let's say we're get we're heading towards a more expensive currency, right? So when you when we start to hear deflation, yeah, we, and anything, you know, minus, like minus one inflation, minus 2% inflation, that's known as deflation. So we're heading in this direction, right? So we're heading where um, disinflationary pressures, right? So in order to get 
uh, when when prices when inflation sorry was above where well, inflation is really prices, but when inflation was above the two percent target and heading lower, right? In order to get inflation back to two percent, the um, the central bank had to hike. Correct. That's why we you know last year uh, at the beginning of this year we had yeah I say beginning of this year not too sure I can't remember now. Um, uh, but definitely last year they were hiking rates. Yeah, they hiked rates and they ended their hiking cycle uh, end of last year, maybe beginning of this year, right? And then they started cutting rates because inflation was heading down to their 2% target, right? They were heading towards here. Now inflation is overshot. Yeah, it's overshot. And the reason why that is, is because remember deflation is more about, is basically appreciation of a currency. Yeah. And so the currency has been appreciating. And so if the currency has been appreciating, it causes, you know, inflation to go, you know, lower and lower and lower. So in order to get um, the currency to go back to their 2% target, yeah, if they hiked to get it to 2%, yeah, they have to actually do the opposite to get it back to two percent they need it actually cheaper yeah because it's getting too expensive it's appreciating too much and we know that cuts yeah cuts are designed to devalue or depreciate a currency d-e-v-a-l-u-e -E. sorry about that right so devalue a currency that's what cuts are designed to do so to counter currency appreciation yeah, central banks have to cut. Now, the cut, whether it's 25 basis points or 50 basis points, right, will depend upon how much the currency is appreciating, yeah, in terms of deflation. Now, because we're overshooting and, we're, and we've been on this lower trend, that's what this is saying. It's saying that the Swiss francs rally, yeah, appreciation to the strongest level in almost a decade has raised the prospect of the first large interest rate cut by a major central bank this year. First large 50 basis points. Yeah. Does that make sense, guys? Does that all make sense? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. No one left behind. I hope everyone ex uh, understands that. Yep. Excellent. 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 Right. Brilliant. So, um, so that's basically what this is saying, right? So, while economists forecast the Swiss National Bank to lower rates by another quarter point, yeah, the probability of a half point reduction has been rising steadily. So, the market understands this whole, you know, the whole mechanism and how how inflation. Um, and deflation works with interest rates, right? So that's basically what it's saying. So the franc's advance is cramping exports and lowering the price of imports at a time when inflation is already well within the S&P's target and near a three-year low. Currency strategists at MUFG Bank, UBS Group AG and Bank of America Corp say to further stem the currency's gains, policymakers should take more forceful action forceful action 50 basis points they're not afraid to surprise the market said Derek Halpenny head of FX research at MUFG Bank and to shake FX it's probably what's needed so that's why it's happening Digo yes you have a question uh you can turn your mic on if you would like uh, Swiss National Bank, they've been cutting interest rate. Um, even though they're cutting the price still uh, going up, it does mean uh, that whatever is driving the, the price up, is it looks like it's stronger than the cut. That is a risk-off scenario. That's yes. So um, if they come to, call, uh, to cut for uh, 50%, and it's the risk off is still remaining, it wouldn't be like uh, pointless. Like meaning it would keep driving the price up even though because mm. they're cutting the price at a tough time 
because I find people going up anyway. Right. I don't. I don't think it would drive. It, it. It would. It would drive it higher, right? Because remember, cuts. The 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 cuts. The whole point in cuts is to try to devalue the currency. Is to try to make the currency less attractive. Yeah. So think about it in terms of you know of banks, right? If you if you're you know you've got two banks that you could bank with. One is giving you an interest rate of you know two percent, and another one is giving you an interest rate of five percent. You're gonna go with the one that has five percent. Now imagine you're still on the fence. You're thinking, oh maybe maybe I should go with the one with two percent. Maybe they're offering I don't know a free account or whatever it is, right? Whereas the one with five percent, you've got to pay monthly for an account, right? But then you find out that the bank that's offering two percent is gonna be cutting your interest rate to now one point five percent. Right, it's gonna make it even less attractive. You're not gonna to want to put your money in there, correct? Uh, yes. And that's the aim of cuts. Cuts, cuts don't automatically. And even though I've got the equal sign, right? It doesn't. It doesn't always equal devaluation because there are other things going on. As you, as you correctly said, we have risk events, right? So money can still flow into the Swiss National Bank and the Swiss currency in a risk off event, even though the central bank is cutting rates. Yeah, that scenario can definitely still happen if, you know, there is a risk off scenario or risk off events that are driving um, uh, investors to, you know, to put their money into safe havens, because in a risk off environment, investors are not so much worried about their, their returns they're more worried about their, um, uh, I guess, keeping their money safe. Yeah, that's what they're more concerned with. Yeah. And in the risk on environment, that's when they're looking for returns. So, yes, maybe in the short term, while we do have risk off on a risk off environment. Yeah. Maybe the Swiss franc may start to st still continue to rise, even though the central bank is cutting rates. But guess what's going to happen eventually? The risk of scenario is going to come, you know, is going to is going to go. And then the Swiss National Bank is going to look very, very, very expensive. The Swiss franc is going to look extremely expensive. And where the money is made is where you have a disconnect between price. Yeah. And the fundamentals, because then this scenario is going to come back into play. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So, yes. You know, it can, you know, and, and we saw that, and I think you maybe you might have come in a bit late, but we saw that with the New Zealand dollar where they cut rates, but prices went higher for a couple of weeks. And now eventually, a few weeks later, we've seen the, the New Zealand drop like a stone kind of thing. So it happens and it's not and it's not an instant reaction. I know a lot of traders tend to think that the, um you know, a central bank cutting rates, it has to it has to drop. No, it doesn't. Um, it normally stays in some sort of range or auction, depending on what's, you know, whether where they're going to be cutting once, twice, three times and what future expectation is. But ultimately, if they're still on that cutting cycle, yet prices are going higher, then that you should always look at that as a shorting opportunity. Just It's just a way to get in, you know, um, uh, for more, for better price, right? Or to short from a higher distance. Hello, Alexandros. Long time. Hope you're well. Hope you are well. Um, so Swiss franc overall is still a sell for me. No reason to no. <laughs> uh, you're, you're too kind. You're too kind, Alexandros. Um, yeah. So the uh, the Swiss franc for me is still a sell. Um, I'm out of the uh, Swiss yen trade, so I hit my full targets on that. Um, uh, Swiss pound is something I'm looking at. Um, and Aussie. Um, Aussie Swiss. I actually entered into that trade twice, and I'm I'm gonna go over this trade because um, I made some profit uh, earlier uh, today, and then I've actually got back in. Matter of fact, on that trade, so I'll show you uh, that as well. Uh, CAD Canadian dollar. No reason to uh, to again buy the CAD. It's still a sell against the Australian dollar, the pound, and the yen of, um, are my main picks. Bank of Canada to cut rates by 25. Uh, I've got to update that. 
uh, 25 in when's their next one they cut in september i think it must be um october or november i think it might be um that's the expectation and again if you've been following the uh, the canadian dollar um pretty much the data is showing that they could it says here it says the the scope the bank of canada has scoped to cut by 50 basis points so um let's see what happens with that also as well what's been going against the um the canadian dollar is the fact that we have uh, oil canadian dollar hammered by oil plunge so canadian dollar is under pressure against all of its g10 rivals amid sell-off in oil and commodities it says here crude oil exports account for 10 percent of canada's gdp dollar cad and the oil price have positive correlation over longer term time frames and that's important to understand it doesn't mean that because oil went up this day you know in time that the canadian dollar is going to go higher you know or this hour or this second right they're not correlated like that but over longer term time frames um you typically do have uh correlations right so uh so yeah oil and this is going down it says further the further plunge in oil to the price today was probably reflects price that OPEC revised down its 2024-2025 forecast for oil demand, mostly on the back of weaker demand from China. That is in line with earlier data out of China, which showed crude oil imports are down year over year, says Diana Lovanel, senior market economist at Capital Economics. So, um, I mean, even if it wasn't for that, the in terms of monetary policy, the Canadian dollar should still really be um, uh, a buy, I'm sorry, a sell, um, because they are cutting rates more than um, uh, more than uh, other central banks, right? Especially the Australian dollar. This is the reason why I have it, you know, the sell bias against the Aussie, the pound and the yen. So the Australian dollar, again, nothing's really changed over the last uh, months. I think we've had this uh, buying the Australian dollar. Uh, fundamentally, they are the last central bank at the moment to look to cut rates, which then means that if everyone else is cutting rates and they're the last to cut, then the Australian dollar should really be um, a buy, right? Oh, sorry, let me go back as well to, I've missed out a few of these in terms of the, uh, in terms of um, the, index right so sorry if we're looking to buy the pound so quickly if we're looking to buy the pound now is a is a nice opportunity to look for buys right so looking at the uh, the rsi of course on the daily time frame chart we're in that bargain price so if you see the pound is a bargain then now is nice confluence on any pound pairs to look for buys in that nice demand zone um, with the euro, if you're looking to buy the euro, of course, you know, the euro is looking cheap technically. But um, if you're looking to sell the euro, then you have to wait for a pullback. Yeah, up into some sort of level and have the euro come up into, you know, to be more of a sell. Uh, the Swiss franc, uh, again, selling the Swiss franc was been quite nice because we are in that extreme. So, um, yeah, that was where we were. So um, we did pop up above the supply zone, but ultimately we've come back down inside and, uh, you know, the uh, the Swiss franc really should be more of a sell than a buy. Um, fundamentally over time, remember, this is seen as expensive, right? So just to go back, this is very expensive. So they the, 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 the Swiss National Bank need prices down here. Yeah, this is where they need prices to get inflation back up to their 2% target. Yeah. So the central bank are going to try to make a cut by 50 basis points to try to weaken the Canadian, um, the Swiss franc to try to get inflation back up to 2%. Uh, the Canadian dollar, if you are looking to short the Canadian dollar, now really isn't the time because we are considered on the expensive side. You really want to see prices, you know, the RSI come up to at least above fair value, obviously preferably more expensive, and then look for short trades. Uh, to sell the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar has been a nice buy for me. So um, we're seeing the Australian dollar, um, you know, at a discount, a nice discount on the RSI. And so now, hopefully, 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 
if risk off doesn't um, affect the Australian dollar too much, then and we get back to some sort of normality, then I think the Australian dollar is an absolute bargain here. And I'm hoping that, you know, uh, my Auss Aussie trades will uh, start to uh, fly. So also as well, just a quick one. Um, let me just add something here. So remember we were talking about the VIX, right? So let me just add the VIX to this. That's what we here. New pain. So you'll see that the VIX and the Australian dollar typically move inversely as well. Now, there is a caveat to that because, of course, in terms of risk sentiment, you want to, you know, the higher we go above 20, 20 is kind of seen as maybe a bit of a line in the sand in terms of risk on and risk off. So the lower we go, the more risk on, the higher we go above 20 is, is extreme risk off, right? So when we look at, um, you know, uh, what, uh, the VIX was doing at certain periods, right? When we get that, you know, these large moves, we get these large drops, right? And as we started going to the downside, we started going higher, right? Now, of course, it doesn't mean that because we've got a massive pullback here that we were in risk off. It could just be the fact that the Australian dollar, in terms of monetary policy, you know, was on the weaker side, right? So it's not 100%, you know, correlated. Um, but what you will see, if you notice overall, that when you get, you know, these moves in volatility, these spikes in volatility, you can have both as well. Look at that. We had prices go up, of course, never 100%. But when it started going to the downside, right, we got more upside. Yeah. So, uh, again, you can see it there. We've got that period there, period here. So... Right now, don't want to keep going through them, but right now, of course, we got this spike in the VIX, this downward move here, and um, right now we are, I think we're probably just above that, and I'm hoping that if we can come down a bit and, you know, the VIX can kind of trail off a bit, that this then should want to move higher. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens there. Um... Let me see. Uh, Ruby one says was going to was going. Uh, oh, you just popped in and popped out. All right, Alexandra, no worries. Take care. I'll have the recording out a bit later as well, so you can have a watch of that. Um, sorry, Ruby one, you were talking about. Take care, mate. Take care. What uh, what about the uh, Australian dollar's inflation that they going? Right. So. What are they going to do for that? So inflation, although inflation came down, it wasn't, it didn't come down to the point where the central bank are looking to cut rates, because that's really what it's about. It's really about understanding the central bank's thinking about what the debt and how they interpret the data. So, um, in, yes, inflation did come down. Let me go to the uh, Aussie channel. Right. I think where, where do we see inflation? It said here, if they, yeah, inflation was high. Yeah. They wanted it to come down. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So they've got a, they've got a two to 3% target band. Right. And really the headline is inflation still remains above the RBA's comfort zone. So the RBA is likely to leave rates at 12 year highs this year. So it, although inflation is coming down, it's not enough to trigger the, central bank the rba to start cutting rates that's really the, the 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 main point you know so if that's what the market thinks or that you know they're not going to be cutting this year they've got they're probably going to eventually cut for sure you know because obviously you know you have a cycle right if you have rate hikes eventually you're going to have rate rate cuts but but overall Overall, for now, if they're seen as the last central bank to cut rates currently, why, you know, there's no need to second guess, you know what I mean? We might as well just keep buying the Australian dollar until maybe something changes or until, you know, they catch up with cuts um, with other central banks. So right now, what we're seeing this year 
in terms of monetary policy is one central bank is looking to hold rates until 2025, yeah? Whereas other central banks are cutting rates. Some are going to be cutting once. Some are going to be cutting twice. Some are going to be cutting three times. Some are going to be cutting by more than others. Do you know what I mean? In terms of maybe 50 basis points. Some are going to be cutting by 25. But regardless of how you look at it, these guys, these guys, but these banks are actively trying to de- value their currency by cutting rates yeah and the central bank of australia the rba are not that's it yeah that's it you know that's that's it that's it ruby one and that's the way that i always think about things i try to just you know just see through the noise because there's a lot of there is a lot of noise you know, and um, there's a lot of maybe things to focus on. And this is why I always say to to traders, just if you're if you're trading currencies and even if you're trading other um, other markets, like, you know, maybe even bonds or, or stocks, at the end of the day, it still comes down to, oh, commodities are obviously, you know, different, but um, to a certain extent, but ultimately it should really be about, um, you know, interest rates, inflation, um, GDP. That's it. And what the central bank is likely to do with their monetary policy. Uh, had stock question, but for the end. Okay, no worries, Ruby Ron. No worries at all. So, um, so yeah, so that's where we are with the Australian dollar. So, when we look at the fundamental analysis spreadsheets, and let me go to the economic data.